Hello and welcome to my review of Alone Season 9 from a medical point of view. I can't wait to have this place try and break me for the first time on Alone. If you've watched the series and you've wondered, for instance, how was it that Adam was able to withstand his intestinal infection while Benji wasn't? I feel like I got a pretty good fever. My eyes are burning up. Or how did Pablo lose his appetite after being in the wilderness for months and basically not eating? What the heck is going on? Or which survivalist probably came closest to losing his or her life? Then I'm going to wrap up the video by talking about something that I really haven't heard anyone discuss, and that is what dangers do these survivalists face? after they've been extracted, especially those that have been out there for several months and who are severely malnourished. So for those of you who are not familiar with this show, it's a TV reality show featuring 10 survivalists. They're dropped off in a remote wilderness area. 10 participants fight to survive in the hunting ground of the world's largest land predator. This season, it happens to be in Labrador, Alaska. So they're given 10 items of their choice. They're given a satellite phone in case they want to tap out and obviously Obviously, they're also given a video camera so that they can film themselves. So these contestants, they have basically no contact with the outside world or any other humans, and they are there for an indefinite period of time, and each one has no idea what's going on with the other survivalists. So if somebody else taps out, they're not informed of this, so they have no idea where they sit in the competition. So sit back and enjoy as I delve into the medical aspects of Season 9 alone. So Season 9 alone, it was highlighted by several survivalists being hit hard by intestinal issues. So let's talk about Adam's issues first. The reason that I overslept is I was massaging my belly and trying to get it out last night. Something is not right in my belly. I'm gonna eat some of these cranberries. I hope that settles things a little bit. Thought of a few of the worst case scenarios. Giardia, trichinosis, salmonella, E. coli. So Adam does have a pretty good idea of what he may be infected with. Now, all four of these pathogens, they are acquired by consuming either contaminated water or food, or also by coming in contact with contaminated surfaces. Now, let's go ahead and go through these four pathogens. All right, let's start off with salmonella. So this bacterium, this is found in the intestines of animals, and it can be transmitted through contaminated water, food, or surfaces. Symptoms include abdominal cramps, diarrhea, and fever. There's going be a common theme here as you might expect. Next we have E. coli. So E. coli is a bacterium and the way you get infected with this is through contaminated water or food. E. coli is found in the intestines of humans and animals. Now symptoms of being infected with this include diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and also fever. Next we have Giardia. Now Giardia is a parasite that can be found in contaminated water and it can also cause basically the same things diarrhea, abdominal cramps, and also dehydration. And lastly we have trichinosis. This is caused by a parasitic infection by a roundworm. The roundworm is known as trichinella spiralis. Now this is usually acquired by eating raw or undercooked pork that's infected with this parasite. It is time for me to accept the fact that I have some kind of gut parasite. Not indigestion or too many cranberries. <laughs> it is. I think I've got Giardia. So in many cases, giardiasis is self-limiting, meaning that the infection will go away on its own without any specific treatment. However, this can take several weeks to months. We're gonna cruise up onto the hill and collect some birch bark. And then we'll make that into a tea tonight that will hopefully help with my intestinal issues. So what we're gonna do is harvest the inner bark off of the tree very carefully Suddenly, that's a whole new level of self-reliance and a whole different set of skills that you have to depend upon to self-heal. Okay, so what about birch? Well, birch has been used for various medicinal purposes, including to soothe an upset stomach. And this is due to its anti-inflammatory and also its anti-spasmodic properties. However, there's limited scientific evidence to support the use of birch for this. Okay, so in the wild, there are several different natural remedies that you can use to help soothe stomach discomfort, which is caused by a gut parasite. And here are a few options. You've got ginger, garlic, peppermint, and chamomile. Unfortunately, you're not going to find any of these in Labrador, Alaska. Nice cup of tea. That'll make me feel better. 
The stomach feels better. The tea works perfectly. Self-care day. That's what I need. I was worried that if it got worse and I couldn't hold food down, that I might have to tap. Oh, I feel so much better. But whatever it is, it's feeling mitigated and I'm managing it, and it's not going to take me out of the game. All right, so he's feeling better. Was it the birch, or did his body just clear whatever pathogen he was infected with, or was it something else? Interestingly, the cranberries that he ate probably did more good than the birch. Cranberries have a compound called proanthocyanidins, which have an anti-inflammatory effect. So by reducing inflammation in the gut, these proanthocyanidins can help alleviate some of the symptoms that you have when you have a gut infection. Additionally, cranberry also has other antibacterial properties. For example, cranberry juice has been shown to inhibit the growth of various bacteria, including E. coli. Now, another resource that Adam could have taken advantage of is sweet gale. Sweet gale has been used for a variety of different medicinal purposes, including as a natural remedy to help prevent dehydration. Sweet gale also contains tannins, which can help to reduce fluid loss by promoting fluid retention in the body. Now, sweet gale is also known to have astringent properties, which can help to constrict the tissues and help to reduce fluid loss. Now, the caveat here is that there's limited scientific research on the effectiveness or the safety of sweet gale. So if you're going to use this, I would use this as a last resort. So my take is that Adam probably had either E. coli, Campylobacter, or Salmonella. And the reason I say this is that these infections are self-limited, so they will go away on their own without any treatment specifically. And symptoms such as diarrhea, abdominal pain, they may last for a few days up to a week before resolving on their own. Okay, so now that we've talked about Adam, how does this differ? from Benji's case. The good news is I'm still alive. I'm still going through stomach cramps and chills and feel like I got a pretty good fever. My eyes are burning up. My whole body's actually burning up in the sleeping bag. Maybe hope that tomorrow is a new day and uh, maybe it just goes away, but we'll see. I don't know what the hell, this beaver, I got like beaver fever. Oh, that's right up in my stomach. Ah, oh, holy <laughs> Haven't slept all night. And just nothing getting better here. Just about lost the last of my bowels there. And I'm super stiff and can barely get around. So that's the end of the road for me. Hey, good morning, this is Benji. Yeah, I'm officially tapping out. I've got no more, I, I'm wicked dehydrated. All right, so let's just assume that Benji does have giardiasis, which is a parasitic infection caused by the protozoan Giardia lamblia. It is a common cause of diarrhea, especially in areas where there's poor hygiene and also poor sanitation. And at the risk of sounding like a broken record, symptoms include diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, weight loss, and also fatigue. Now, as with E. coli, this infection is also usually self-limited. However, with giardiasis, and I think this is the kicker here, giardiasis can last a couple of weeks and I think this is what ultimately took Benji down plus also given the fact that he's about 10 years older than Adam this obviously didn't help his case okay so next let's move on to the topic of Jesse and her using activated charcoal to help try and combat what she thinks is increased acidity in her stomach and my stomach's pretty upset again I think it's actually just acid reflux it's just my stomach producing a lot of acid and there's nothing in there for it to digest it's not a fun feeling, for sure. So I picked out some charcoal before I started the fire last night. I'll eat some of that this evening. All right, there's the cone charcoal. Out here, you can't just run down to your local pharmacy or something and grab whatever it is you need. So I just woke up and uh, vomited for the third time tonight. Unfortunately, the activated charcoal was not effective. So activated charcoal is not really used to help decrease acid in the stomach. Activated charcoal is commonly used in cases of overdose or poisoning. And what it does is it helps prevent absorption of toxic substances. When your body is under physiological stress, what happens is the sympathetic nervous system kicks in. And what this causes is an increased production of stomach acid. And you can have symptoms such as just 
she was experiencing things like acid reflux and heartburn. This is one of the reasons why when a patient is admitted to the hospital, especially one who's sick enough to be admitted to the ICU or to the CCU, they're almost invariably placed on a medication like a proton pump inhibitor to help decrease the acid in the stomach. What this does is it helps prevent something called stress gastritis. Now, there are several resources in the wilderness which may help alleviate some of these symptoms. And the first two are supposedly found in Labrador, Alaska. The first is ginger. Now, ginger has some natural anti-inflammatory properties and it may help to soothe the lining of the stomach. And it can also reduce inflammation, which can help alleviate the symptoms of excess acid, such as acid reflux or gastritis. Now, another option would be slippery elm. Now, the bark of this tree has traditionally been used as a natural remedy for digestive issues. So it may help to coat and also to soothe the lining of the digestive tract, which obviously can in turn help to alleviate some of the symptoms of excess acid. Now, the other two options, which unfortunately are not found in Labrador, Alaska, would be marshmallow root and licorice root. Now, let's talk a little bit more about Jesse's extraction. Jesse? I'm okay. But if I get up and do anything, then the odds of me throwing stuff are way high. Okay. I just, I've just had a hard time since I'm water. And how many times have you thrown up? Nine or ten. And are you able to drink any water at this point? I drink it. just usually doesn't stay down. I'm bad right now. It makes me want to vomit every time I try to even take a sip of water. And it just keeps getting worse. So it's probably a pipe dream that I'm going to be able to make it better out here. Hey, Jesse. Our concerns right now are that you have a pretty severe inflammation of your stomach lining, which if that's left untreated, could lead to bleeding or a hole in your stomach, both of which can be life-threatening. It doesn't feel like you are able to take care of yourself at this point. It's not safe for you to remain. I have to medically extract you. So Jesse's extraction is based on the fact that she's not able to take care of herself, which is pretty obvious. She's vomited nine to 10 times and she's not able to keep anything down, including fluids. And what he's telling her is that she's got inflammation of her stomach lining, which is known as gastritis. Now he's also worried that this could develop into a stomach ulcer, which can potentially perforate or burst. If this were to happen, given her situation where she is and lack of immediate medical assistance, in all honesty, she probably would not have made it. Another thing that could happen to Jesse is something called Borhoff's tear or Borhoff syndrome, which is basically a tear or a rupture of the esophagus, which usually occurs after severe vomiting or retching. And what can happen if you have a Borhoff's tear is food, fluid, and gastric acid can leak into your chest cavity, which can lead to some very, very severe complications. Now, symptoms of a Borhoff's tear, these are pretty severe. These include chest pain, difficulty breathing, fever, rapid heart rate, and sometimes even shock. So Borhoff's is definitely a medical emergency. And sometimes what's required is surgery so that you can repair the tear. And also you can drain any fluid which may have leaked into the chest cavity. Okay, so in my opinion, Jesse was the one who probably was the closest to not making it out alive. At this point, she's She's probably in acute kidney injury because she's not able to keep any fluids down and had this progressed she probably would have ended up in acute renal failure or acute kidney failure kidney failure leads to a buildup of phosphates and also acids in your bloodstream these are natural metabolites that all of us produce which are easily cleared by our kidneys however if your kidneys are not functioning well you're gonna have an increase in phosphate and also acids which leads in turn to metabolic acidosis which in turn leads to an elevation of your potassium level. And not to be morbid here, but this is actually how they execute inmates on death row is with a lethal injection of potassium chloride. So it's a good thing that they extracted her when they did. Otherwise, it could have gotten really, really ugly really quickly. Now, I want to turn to a topic which I really haven't heard discussed regarding these survivalists, and that is what happens to them after they've been extracted. So they aren't necessarily out of the woods just yet. Big boys. And the body consumes on a priority basis. There are preferences for energy through the blood sugar, burnt through the liver stores of sugar, burnt through all the fat because I can just feel skin on my stomach and organ fat. That's probably very depleted because I can suck in now before I couldn't even do that. Had a little more. I think we're pretty golden. Good luck. 
We are looking skinny, boy. Now looking skinny. There is one potentially life-threatening condition which can occur after they've been extracted, and that is refeeding syndrome. Refeeding syndrome is a potentially life-threatening condition, and sometimes we see this in people who are either severely malnourished or those who have been on a fast for a long time. And when these people start eating again, sometimes they eat too much or too quickly, and this can cause some issues. This condition is characterized by an increase in glucose and insulin, and insulin causes electrolytes such as potassium, magnesium, and phosphorus to go into the cells and out of the bloodstream, which can cause the levels of these minerals to plummet. And this can lead to a range of symptoms, including irregular heart rhythms, organ failure, respiratory failure, coma, and even death. And the risk of developing refeeding syndrome is related to the degree of malnutrition and also the duration of malnutrition. So people who are severely malnourished or who have lost a significant amount of weight are at a higher risk for developing this syndrome. So we'd be particularly worried about those survivalists who are out there for a couple of months. To prevent refeeding syndrome, typically you start with small, frequent meals and then gradually increase the amount and type of food over time. Also, electrolyte levels are monitored very closely and any imbalances are corrected as necessary. And just as an aside, this is one of the really big concerns in treating patients who have severe anorexia. So these patients are usually admitted into the hospital and they're fed in a supervised manner and their electrolytes are checked often. Okay, so let's change gears now. Let's move to Pablo. This guy was out there for months and months and all of a sudden he loses his appetite. How does this happen? That's my meal. Funnily enough, I don't feel like eating, so I'm just gonna eat what I can. My stomach right now is just feeling like it doesn't want food. This is such an unexpected challenge for me, not wanting to eat. The fact that my body just doesn't want to eat, that is a problem. I do not want to get sick. I don't want to get to that point where I puke because that can be extremely harsh on your body and can bring you down. What the heck is going on? Yes, going on a long fast, which is basically what Pablo did, can cause you to lose your appetite. When you fast, your body goes into a state of ketosis where it starts to burn stored fat for energy. As a result, your body produces ketones, which can suppress appetite. Additionally, the longer you fast, the more your body adjusts to the lower calorie intake, which can in turn lead you to have a further decrease in hunger and appetite. This is a natural survival mechanism, which helps the person to conserve energy during periods where food is scarce. Now, the hormone that is primarily responsible for stimulating appetite is called ghrelin. Ghrelin is produced and released by cells in the stomach. A couple of key points, especially for outdoor survivalists to keep in mind is, first of all, be aware that stress is known to affect the regulation of appetite and food intake and also may affect ghrelin levels. Some studies have shown that chronic stress may decrease ghrelin levels. Also, changes in diet and sleep pattern can negatively affect your ghrelin levels. For example, if you consume either a low calorie or a low fat diet, this can decrease your ghrelin levels and changes in sleep patterns, which these uh, survivalists definitely endured. This can also affect negatively your ghrelin levels. Alrighty, we've come to the end. I hope you enjoyed it. That was my take on Alone Season 9 from a medical perspective. If you enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button and or subscribe. I'd greatly appreciate it. Until next time, stay safe.